I have a new guest. I've been doing this for 24 years, and Abe Greenwald has never been my guest before. Abe is the executive editor of Commentary Magazine. He joins us. Good morning, Abe, and welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show for the first time. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Abe, I, I always begin with a brand new guest. I used to have two standard questions, now I have five. And it's just a ritual, so I have to go through it with you. First of all, was Alger Hiss oh, a communist I... spy? You bet. Number two, have you read The Looming Tower? Lawrence Wright. Yes, a long time ago. Yeah, long time ago, but that's what I check with people. Number three, just give us a minute on what you know about the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Well, uh, if you point to any map uh, almost around the world before uh, before its present condition, uh, it will look very different, and that is largely a result um, of the Ottoman Empire and its conquests and um, its holdings. And it lasted from 1200 until 1918. I just want to put that out there. There you go. Okay, two more left. What about the British mandate, Abe? What do you know about the British mandate? The British mandate for Palestine? Yes. Uh, That was, that was, uh, well, that was um, one of the many stages that led to the the current modern state of Israel um, rejected, um, as were all the preceding and following stages by the Arab leaders. And then my last was, question, was, what uh, were the Romans up to in AD 70? I mean, they were doing a lot. They had a big empire. But what comes to mind when I say Romans in AD 70? AD 70 was the, was that the, was that the siege in uh, yeah, Jerusalem? Yeah, destruction sure. of the second you temple. May, you may have, okay. There now, we go. Oh, okay. If I ask those five Ooh. questions of a random assortment of the campus demonstrators of the last two months. How many of them would get one, much less five questions, right? Oh, you'd have to start off much more basically than that, right? What was the the first question you asked me was- uh, Was Alger Hiss a communist spy? Oh, right, yeah, they would say Alger who. That's right. Um, and, uh, and, and, and say um, if he was uh, any, any good, yes. And and if they had read Lawrence Wright, they wouldn't be at the demonstration. Abe, I bring this up because I always ask, I'd like to get a baseline of knowledge. I think the commentary podcast is the best podcast in America. I know your base of knowledge, but now you've written The Woke Jihad. And I think, I don't throw this around very often, but I think it's up there with dictatorships and double standards. The November 1979 essay by Gene Kirkpatrick in commentary, which became famous and sort of defined what Reagan was against, double standards. And I think the woke jihad is going to capture a lot of what President Trump or former President Trump is going to campaign against. What Are you surprised by the reaction to your essay? Um, I'm very pleased by it. I Just briefly, when I, in writing anything, I sort of never have a good sense of how good a job or poor a job I did uh, while I'm writing it or immediately after. It takes me a little while to um, assess it with any um, kind of fairness. Um, but I think I did a pretty decent job, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm very glad that it's caught on. I mean, as I say in the piece, um, most Americans despise these campus protests, recognize them not as pro-Palestinian, but as pro-Hamas and as anti-Semitic. Um, so I'm not entirely surprised that it's caught on in the sense that I think the majority of the country is sympathetic to what I'm saying. But I think what surprises me is it framed for me, and I think it's framed for a lot of people, that the woke jihad explains how the radical left got into bed with the Salafis, how Wahhabism and BLM decided to join together. And while you say they need each other, they don't love each other. At least The left loves the jihad, but the jihad doesn't love the left. Do you want to expand on that, Abe? Sure. Um, well, the left loves the jihad because it's everything that the left, first of all, would like to be, but everything it romanticizes as well, which is kind of exoticism, a sense of suffering um, and self-centeredness and uh, self-pity, but also um, violence. Um, and the left loves violence. Uh, violence in the name of uh, a supposedly just cause, a supposedly righteous cause, um, and it is anti-American and it's anti-Israel. So the left loves everything about the jihad. Um, jihadists 
could not possibly love the leftists that uh, they're involved with here because uh, jihadists are trained, educated to be um, to think of themselves as superior to infidels who do not believe as they believe in Allah, who do not uh, believe in uh, fighting to the death for the cause, um, who are not sexual libertines as undoubtedly a uh, great many uh, young American college students are, um, uh, who do not, jihadists do not believe in women roaming freely, um, expressing themselves uh, in, in every imaginable way. They are not LGBTQ friendly, uh, and they certainly aren't fans of the Jews. Um, and there are a number of Jews uh, or nominal Jews and nominal Jewish groups uh, involved in, in, in these campus protests. I also like to think, Abe, and correct me if you're wrong, the vast majority of both the woke left and the jihad, and by this I mean Salafist Wahhabism, people who read Saeed Qutub or have heard of him and they are willing to die for the cause, both groups are pretty dumb. And I mean, just as a basic statement of, do they know anything? They're ignorant of a lot. They could not tell you about the British Mandate. They don't know about the Ottomans. They have no idea even that Gaza used to belong to Egypt. Do you agree with me that both the jihadists that we see on TV and the campus protests generally run towards the stupid end of the bell curve? Um, I think when you get down to the foot soldier level <laughs> that we see, undoubtedly, um, the leftists, I'll, I will have to say, for my money, are probably dumber than the jihadists. When you get to the yes. high level jihadists, you have to you have to actually, first of all, you have to um, know Muslim scripture and you have to, um, you're involved in <clears throat> planning an operational stages of um of of military actions and 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 whatnot so they have to be a little more savvy but um as we've seen in interview after interview um the the people gathered at college campuses are just fools they don't know when they say from the river to the sea they don't know what river they don't know what sea they don't know about the british mandate they don't know about the balfour declaration they don't know about the about uh, any of it. So, yes, they are they are very stupid. And I'm glad um, you made that decision. And they have, the, because they have the benefit of not knowing it. Yeah. That, they, they do not know what they don't know. But they also don't know. I, I'm glad you mentioned Saeed Qutub was a brilliant ideological fanatic, much like Castro, much like Shea, much like Mao. These fanatics can write a bit, and Qutub could write a bit, and Zawahiri and Bin Laden and Zarqawi. Zarqawi was a thug, so I'm not going to put him in there. He might have been as stupid as a desk, but he blew up people. McChrystal got him. My question is, generally speaking, if we get below the top 1% of the jihadi leadership, they're not educated either. They might have memorized the Quran, but they're not educated. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, most definitely true. And, it, you know, look, that is, by the way, that's a direct result of the jihad or of Islamism or Salafist. Uh, uh, governance, where which is um, in large part uh, an obscurantist regime, where knowledge is um, forbidden in in many respects. So they are kept um, in a state of ignorance. Um, uh, so yeah, this is that 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 is that that is that is part of that is part of what what keeps their the the mass commitment going is is their inability inability to see outside of their of the framework they're in. Now, Abe, I've been a member of a law school faculty at Chapman since 1996. And I go to the meetings when I'm there. I'm, I'm not there, in the, except now. I'm old, so I only go every other spring. But I'm tenured, and I drop in. In all those years, I've never heard one discussion among the faculty about a serious matter of current affairs, like, for example, Israel's war of existential self-defense in Gaza. Do you think that faculty meetings anywhere ever have serious discussions that require facts such as when did the Ottoman Empire start and how far did it go? Do you think that ever happens? Well, thankfully, I've never been to a, <laughs> a, a faculty meeting of any sort. So I, I, I hope never to know uh, the answer to that. Um, but my suspicion is no. Uh, I think to the extent that I think any of this is discussed in, in such precincts, um, it has to do with, oh, have you seen the horrible images um, from Gaza? Maybe something along those lines. Abe, I, um, I've had John Podhortz on the show for years. I consider him a friend. And Matt Continenti has been on often. He's a green room friend. 
Uh, Bethany Mandel takes the place of Seth. So Seth never gets on, but Bethany's on once a week. I haven't met Christine Rosen. I want to have her on. I just think the commentary podcast, which feature those four plus you, is the best podcast in America. How long have you been doing it? Who organizes? I know John is the, the conductor of the band, but the band plays together marvelously well. How long have you guys been doing this for? Well, let's see. This uh, it, it, The origin really has to do with Noah Rothman, when Noah Rothman was with us. And to be honest, I can't even remember at this point when that was. It was around 2015, maybe. Um, it started out as just John and Noah, uh, the two of them discussing politics once a week, twice a week. I don't remember. Um, it's been a while. Then I joined in. Then uh, various other... Uh, uh, writers and uh, editors on staff at the time joined in. Um, but what it really sort of coalesced, really came together and became what it is, I would say, uh, at the start of the pandemic. Um, when we weren't in our offices, uh, we were all home. And uh, there was this sense that uh, people need something, uh, uh, some sort of ersatz community, um, something that uh, people are a little too anxious to sit and read as much as they would have before. Maybe there's, there's some other way to connect. So we decided to do it every day, every weekday during early on in the pandemic. And, um, that was also a great, um, opportunity for us for, for, for the, for the, for the podcast core at that time to become closer, to become, uh, to get to know each other's rhythms and ways uh, in terms of conversation. So that that made us a more cohesive team. And, um, uh, and, and I think the brand sort of became what it was around then. And then as the pandemic wound down, um, we started toying with the idea of maybe going back to a less rigorous uh, non-daily schedule. And we asked uh, listeners and overwhelmingly they wanted us to stay uh, doing it every day. And so we do. And um, I think we're, we're, I don't actually listen to a lot of podcasts myself. I listen to some, um, but uh, none sort of religiously. And, um, but my understanding is, from what I can tell compared to other podcasts and from knowing how we do ours, um, there's a looseness to ours that I think is um, a large part of what people like about Abe, it. Abe, uh, I believe I should trademark it's worse than that because I use that on Twitter before anyone else did on X saying, Abe, it's worse than that green wall. I just want the people you to know I started that and I'm glad you've adopted it and embraced it. Abe, I want to read five sentences from your essay, The Woke Jihad. But the performative lunatics who turned identity fanaticism into a national pastime are enemies of Israel, the Jews, the United States and human decency itself. As with previous left-wing campaigns, the pro-Palestinian movement offers nothing in support of its supposed purpose. It sides with Gaza's governing terrorists who start wars with the express goal of producing a surplus of dead Gazans. No, the encampments are not pro-Palestinian. They're the latest expression of the social justice left's impulse to destroy the virtuous and raise up the wicked. These seem to me to be obvious facts, Abe Greenwald. Did anyone push back against these facts? Not yet, not in the essay. Um, people push back on it all the time on social media um, uh, when I when I say similar things, um, perhaps um, less less thought out. Um, but no, I don't think you can uh, really uh, push back on this. I mean, the only the only pushback that you hear from sort of sympathetic media um, is that the pro you have it all wrong. The protesters just don't want to see uh, dead bodies. They don't want to see innocent people die. That is why they're out there. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is the animating force behind the protests, um, which is well and good, but doesn't explain why they say Intifada revolution, um, why they say uh, we are Hamas, uh, why they say glory to all our martyrs, why they forbid Jewish students from crossing lawns and so on. Um, so, and it also doesn't explain why we haven't seen anything resembling this kind of mobilization on campuses for a whole whole slew of actual humanitarian disasters caused by evil 
government. Most recently before. in Syria, next uh, door. Not no 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 right. encampments to divest from Assad's regime. So Abe, the solution here is a decades long solution if it's ever going to come, which is the reform of the education system, and not at the college level. You can't produce enough Hillsdales to compete with the the Middle Eastern institutes around the country. So are we? Is the West doomed? Because if the West turns against Zionism, it's turning against itself. I think Zionism is an integral part of what we call the West now. By the way, do you agree with that? That if you're pro-Western, you have to be pro-Zion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a, there was a great essay by Norman Podhoretz, um in the 80s, uh, Jacques, that I, that oh, I yes. should read, 82, 82, 83, in which he makes this point explicitly that uh, when anti-Semitism seizes hold of a uh, society, it's because uh, of a democratic society, it's because they have, that society or that country has lost faith um, in, in its Western ideals and in democracy itself. And so it goes for uh, anti-Israel animus as well. Now, now the, the, the anti-Semitism is, um, is, is chan- funneled into uh, anti-Zionism. Um, uh, I don't think the West is doomed. I think uh, elite education may be doomed. Uh, I wouldn't be sad to see it go. Uh, when the West was called or, upon uh, last, Abe, we were a nation of farmers, people on the frontier, and factory floors. If it's called upon to defend the West again, we're not the same people, are we? We don't seem to be. No, not at the moment. But I, I don't. I'm not a. Uh, well, I was about to say I'm not a pessimist by nature. I am a pessimist <laughs> by nature, but I'm not. But I'm not. Well, I had to think about it for a second. I'm not pessimistic about the U.S. Actually, um, and I think uh, uh, surprising things happen uh, to a country when, especially to this country. Um, when when the need becomes obvious, um, when when our uh, ideals are genuinely threatened, um, I hope we don't uh, we don't have to face such a situation. But I wouldn't be entirely shocked that it, were we to face such a situation, that 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 there are so, there's a lot of goodness in the country actually, um, which is why these campus protests are so unpopular. Abe. Um- do you presume who actually I'll, I'll put it objectively, who edits Joseph Epstein, who presumes to edit Joseph Epstein when he sends something in? That would be John Podhoretz uh, does the first edit. Um, and then I, I'll, I'll just go over things in a, in a, with a much lighter hand after that, uh, if, if anything's needed. Uh, if anything's needed from from uh, Epstein uh, on Epstein to begin with, he's such a brilliant writer. Uh, there's not much editing, I think, involved, but. Yeah, he's yeah, my great white that, whale because he re- he refuses to be interviewed. I have every Epstein book behind me or upstairs, and and I simply do not. Uh, I don't think anyone's as equal when it comes to the familiar essay. And I was wondering if you had got charged with that un- unfortunate duty of trying to improve improve that which is very very good. Second question, Abe. I don't know anything about you. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? How did you get to this job? Uh, I'm from. Well, I'm originally from Long Island. Uh, I live in New York. Uh, I was in graduate school for psychology, of all things. I, I, I finished, I, I, I got my master's, um, and then I wrote, uh, I didn't, I lost com- all interest uh, in, in clinical psychology, um, but it was an interesting thing to study at the time. And then I published um, some short fiction in some uh uh, literary journals. Um, and that, then I said to myself, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'm a writer. I'll be a writer. Uh, and the plan was to pursue fiction. Um, I still love reading novels and short stories and I love literature and, and all of that. Um, but then, uh, around nine 11, I got sucked into, uh-huh. uh, geopolitics for the first time in my life. I was really, uh, an ignoramus when it came to, um, political affairs, certainly global, affairs at that point, and just wanting to understand why we were attacked, what on earth had happened, um, led me into, uh, sort of made me a neoconservative um, over time. And then the neoconservative and the, the conservative in me are sort of, you know, they're, 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 um, they're happily blended, I think. Um, and, and that was it. 
You know, I, I, I think there are three categories of conservatives. I don't use the neocon anymore because most of the original neocons are dead. But I, there are national security conservatives, there are free market conservatives, and there are cultural conservatives, usually people of faith who are expressing themselves. And I don't really care what kind of conservative it is, provided that they're voting the right way. Abe, do you think a lot of people who did not, who do not like former President Trump will bring themselves to vote for him given that it is a binary choice this time around or will they stay home? Oh, I think it's a distinct possibility. I, I you know, only anecdotally, um, I know from uh, New York people and I'm, I'm friends with people, close friends with people outside of conservative circles. Um, and I've heard from numerous of them on many occasions, um, either that they're thinking of voting for Trump and they these are people who hated Trump um, or they are definitely voting for Trump. So, yeah, I, th I think I think we're looking at an entirely different election. Um, There's an interesting poll recently that came out. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to cite it because I don't remember. I don't remember who who did the polling. But the, one of the questions comparing uh, both Biden and Trump between 20 and 24, um, one of the questions was, is uh, Donald Trump trustworthy? Uh, he was found now in 2024, on average, to be slightly less trustworthy than in 2020. But interestingly, another question was, is Donald Trump likable? And he was found to be more likable now than in That's interesting. And uh, you, um, know, you persecute someone yes. long enough, he's going to get the advantage of it. Abe, I got to go to the next guest. I want to say thank you for the podcast. Think about doing a Sunday edition. I'd like seven days a week. I know you guys have nothing else to do but feed the podcast needs of your audience. But it's fabulous work. And congratulations on the Woke Jihad, which is going into the Commentary Hall of Fame. Abe, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much.